Jeremy Francis, the Chemical Arts YouTube channel, Instagram, and we were talking about uh, a motto of mine was to customize everything and to kind of um, shape things at a level to where they're forever, you know, mine or there's an imprint in it. It's not just an expression that it's like something uh, in its base or in its trade that would be kind of a, a signature in a way. And that's why I've been so mesmerized by your videos is that you, have from an artistic standpoint, like you're going straight into the baseline of creating your own colors, which I rarely see. And I rarely see anybody give it that much forethought or interest or devote so much of the time kind of learning the processes of, I think, what we as artists or especially visual artists take advantage of all the time. And um, I just wanted to, yeah, figure out like what was you, you were talking about how you came through this from an artistic standpoint and you were getting kind of bummed with all the postmodernist bullshit that's happening, <laughs> which much. I think is now worldwide. I mean, I'm hearing this like issue with universities across the United States as well uh, yeah it must just be you know a systemic academic academic you know issue i think these days uh, absolutely the art schools have like in britain australia and the u.s have just degraded into nonsense right if you go to europe there's still really amazing like technical art schools that teach you age-old traditions and stuff like that mm -hmm. and i think in the u.s you have ateliers Mm -hmm. that still teach craft um but here we in australia we almost have nothing where you, you can go and actually learn the nuts and bolts of being a craftsperson and an artist right it all intellectual with technique as a secondary yeah yeah i'm and, definitely struggling with this i was always too quick to express and not really understanding the theoretical stuff of what i was doing and i think you know, magic and the occult has really kind of reshaped my view, especially in the artistic process of just how intentful every little piece is, you know, yeah. and you you came into creating these pigments and stuff just by the natural need to get down to the nitty gritty. Well, my obsession has always been with whenever I get into something, I have to understand how it works on a fundamental level. So like when I was a musician, um in the not too distant past i got really obsessed with sound recording mm -hmm. and techniques there and then i started building my own guitar pedals and learning like all the circuitry and the electronics sure. associated with that because i just wanted to make weird sounds yeah yeah and to manipulate sound and that's why i've responded really well to your album oh thanks because i was like i could see the consideration to the textural quality of sound mm -hmm. and and that's always been an obsession of mine. And right. I think the same applies to art. It's like a textural, vis visceral sort of thing that I need to, yeah, I need to get as deep in and get your hands dirty with things and really learn what the hell's going on here. Mm -hmm. And then I think more, so for me, the occult, uh, alchemical side of things is a newer development. It's something that's only sort of arisen in the last 12 to 18 months. And it's actually given me focus because for years and years and years, my obsession with being an artist was I want to learn how to do things before I learn to speak, if that makes sense. Sure. I don't want to have... So I used to always have this gripe with my lecturers and I'd be like, you would never go and see a surgeon who only had a theoretical understanding of surgery. Right. You just, you wouldn't want that. Yeah. You, you know, you want, you want your doctors to have some physicality to what they do and, and to actually know their skills. And it's like, why do we expect an artist to be able to just go out there and make art without having any understanding of their skill set and right. what they're doing? actually labored through the process of learning because learning is hard mm -hmm. like, yeah and the, uh, the academic system does not make it any easier i was wondering if you had any insight as to like some alternative avenues for say you know folks that can't really break into the academic forums when it comes to this sort of thing 
Because this is the thing I'm troubling with. I'm having trouble with too at this juncture in my life is wanting to learn more, but feeling the resources kind of evaporate more and more <laughs> as I get older. But also a, an abundance of them spring up elsewhere. So it's hard to delineate which ones I should be um, considering, you know, when there's such an influx of like Skillshare.com or all these other things. And, uh, you know, when we're talking about the issue with the academic or uh, university, you know, and the postmodernism and then it having its own kind of political uh, stance, like where does one seek now? Where does one, you know, attune? Books. Yeah. yeah. Right. Books, Going back uh, to basics, right? Uh, books are a great resource. And, like, I find the Internet if used well right is incredibly useful resource like i think that's one thing that a lot of people forget these days about the internet is it's like that thing's powerful mm -hmm. and we can really use it to learn in in a in a way that we never could before and at a rate that we couldn't it's yeah. just like you you want to know anything you just find the relevant forum you find the relevant experts and you dive deep and you can really just nut any problem out if you know how to ask the right question. And so how are you um, finding, like, what was your funnel into the source material for, you know, I was I was noticing that in one of the YouTube videos that you had mentioned you were using a manuscript from, like, 1908. And I was wondering, like, is there some buzzwords or are there some, like, uh, singular focuses that you know you're looking for when you're going for these old al alchemical manuals well so for the actual pigment making i'm not referring to any alchemical texts oh cool because they don't necessarily deal with that sort of stuff right explicitly um back in the day if you went back to you know sometime between like the 12th century to about you know the 15th century alchemists would have had a role in providing materials for artists for sure because there were a lot of processes that were necessary and alchemists often ended up as like a jack of all trades sort of person right so they were either medicine people or they were metal workers or pigment makers and that sort of stuff so there's definitely been a historical relationship between the alchemist and the artist but for the actual practical um like information about producing pigments and stuff um it's early chemistry essentially like and i'm not a chemist in by any standard um full disclosure I dab <laughs> yeah I, I have a good understanding of chemistry right. but i've never had any formal training um it just started with making fireworks Sure. In, yeah. In the, uh, sort of thing. The anarchist cookbook, that sort of thing. Uh, no, more just, um, just. I just remember one day my dad was trying to make some black powder with my little brother, mm -hmm. and they weren't doing very good at it. And I was like, I'll give that a go. I'll show you guys how it's done. <laughs> nice. And then I just went and. So learned. you've always had a natural inclination yeah. for it. Yes, I think I've always, because I grew up with punk parents, so yep. I've always had the do-it-yourself punk attitude going on, so that's I love it. just where I started, yeah. So what um, uh, what brought you into, like, I mean, it's pretty, it, it gets to an obvious point, right? With, especially with an alchemy, and you stumble into the micro and macro, and you start thinking about as above, so below, and all this shit starts to kind of feed into each other and make sense. So when, when, what was that moment for you where you were like, well, there's, you know, there's something inner or spiritual happening to this, like, constitution that I'm changing? When was that? Well, I, so for a, a fairly long time, I would have sort of considered myself very, very agnostic, very scientific in my thinking, um, very rational. Um, then through a more, but I never discounted the possibility of, I don't know, the great other, sure. you know, if you, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the, the mystery of life and all that sort of stuff. 
somehow at some point during my satin return years mm -hmm. i ended up in a fairly weird you know how that is it's a difficult I difficult do. little period yeah yeah <laughs> very much we all so. have our struggles yeah yeah uh i ended up in like a, a fairly new agey sort of spiritual group thing and some of the experiences i had in there rivaled some of my earlier psychedelic experiences and then i started to realize that the spiritual quest and the relationship with god or gods or whatever was a very powerful like space in which you could explore and it wasn't just a space that you had to use drugs to explore right um anyway that all broke apart and and to shit yeah. and i came out of that and there was some difficult other difficult things going on at the time but i was left in this sort of void of being like how do i reconcile the rational part of me and the new awakened spiritual yearning sure and that's when i just started reading i just started like i i, I picked up jung of course mm -hmm and just dived super deep into Jung's alchemical work. And I started reading the Bible and a bunch of other things yeah. and really just dissecting through this stuff. And then it all started to dawn on me that like narrative, like storytelling and give me a second. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I actually was just going to bring that up. It's the, uh, the, the stories you know that's what grabbed me is that there's like a, a source for you, you know in the archetypes and you think about young and all this i feel like yeah there are these collections of narratives that all of a sudden interweave and you start to pick up on things and i think that's what i meant earlier by the you know discovering that aha moment when you're re you you know you're doing the lead to gold thing but you're realizing yeah. that like holy shit the saturn return and all this stuff is yeah. my lead to gold in a way you know and yeah, yeah they're all just kind of like these common narratives that you know joseph campbell style hero's journey in a way yeah you know? yeah and so i think it led me to this sort of need to explore intelligent discourse on the occult mm -hmm. and uh on archetypal sort of patterns and great mythological stories and realizing that human history was especially like western occult history was just this beautifully rich imagistic place of like i don't know it's just a huge source of inspiration and, and fascination with like it was like a rediscovery of the soul of of humans you know it's right. like the con where consumers and political voices and reactionary actors in this big global world and it's like no 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 we've been at this project of humanity for a really long time and there's so much we can discover about where we're at now through looking at the past right and yeah, yeah. i was just going to bring that up too thinking about you know, I wanted to know if pharmacology has come into your purview at all, especially, you know, it's it's the writings on the wall with that when it can change your mental constitution, you know, physically. But it's also like this insane, I don't know, um, alien kind of moment, you know, of changing your your well-being, your status, for good or for bad. And I wanted to know if you as someone that messes with elements in the way that you do, have you ever... Do you experiment or do you, uh, what's your take on pharmacology? Yeah, well, that's, uh, I have to be careful with what I say here in Australia due to our legal considerations. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Look at me. Uh, I'm shooting from the hip over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, I apologize. I yeah, yeah. Just prior to diving back into art, I took a bit of a foray into, um, doing a lot of work with um in in theogenic plants sure cultivating and um breeding and playing around with growing mushrooms and sure. all of those fun things so yeah i i've done a fair bit of dabbling in that sort of world 
Yeah, um, I think I was talking more because you had made mention of that earlier that like you could reach these moments or these these ideas without the help of uh, those sort of, you know, states. Yep. Um, but what about things like, uh, cause you know, we're talking about the state of humanity right now and this kind of dependence on, uh, mental health, um, uh, pharmacology and, um, yeah. And it's something that I, I'm probably projecting because it's something that's very prevalent in my world right now. Um, and I was just in Los Angeles and saw like, I know I grew up in, you know, really poor neighborhoods in the Southwest and the desert, but there's something happening in LA right now that is just like insanely powerful in the darkest of ways. And it's like this mental health crisis that's going on that there's either not enough services or there's, you know, uh, too much, uh, uninterest and just pill shelving, oh, you that's know, it's happening too yeah. in a big way. Like, I personally have managed to avoid having to go down the the um, chemical pharmacological route, yeah, yeah. Um, which has been lucky. But I've seen so many interesting and complex effects on people around me and that sort of stuff, and their relationships to you know finding pharmacological support for mental health and stuff like that. Right here in Australia, like we had this this thing that just absolutely shocked me um, not too long ago was just the rise in people on antidepressants and the overprescribing here is just rampant, Yeah, which I assume you have the same problem oh, in yeah. the U.S. Absolutely. And we're unfortunately currently in the process of degrading our social services here. Oh. So we used to have a really good social security network that um, – as difficult as it is to interact with, it was still there and you could get financial support and medical support and all that sort of stuff. And we're slowly privatizing and moving towards a more American model mm -hmm. and away from that British model that That's we used too to have. Bad. Is that from, is it uh, more of a, like a libertarian leaning parliament in that sense? Is it? Oh no, we have a very conservative government. Conservative, at the moment. Yeah. But the great thing with Australian politics is we're pretty lazy, we're pretty <laughs> slow, and we're very uneventful. Right. So very little happens, but that means... No news is good news. Yes, yeah. pretty much. It's yeah. stable. Yeah, because so. it's going to hell here. I'm oh, sure yeah. you're we very see aware. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then, you know, I'm in a bubble, too. Um, like I said, I, you know, just... Yeah, I went and saw... I met Derek Hunter... Uh, yep. down in LA and we were seeing friends and family in other areas where you know kind of the ritzy sides and went to downtown LA for the first time in years and just I was just flabbergasted by the amount of like I don't know destitute folks and you yep. know just the complete trash of you know like this western civilization kind of at the end of its ropes it's like very visceral and it probably come off and sound like a fucking spoiled piece of shit you know because you know Derek lives there and he's doing great things and he's like you yeah. know rehabilitating people and it's like I don't want to uh, put I, down I, I, anyone's you know city or, or community it just made such a big impression on me especially going through my own kind of uh battles or i wouldn't say battles anymore but just more like my transmutation with uh pharmacology and you know mental health shit and yeah i was just wondering what that what that looks like in australia so well, I, i'm sad I, to hear that they're taking away services they're just mismanaging yeah we're just bad at figuring things out here but um no i i agree i think living in melbourne it's the same thing we live in i live in a sort of like culturally progressive bubble mm -hmm. uh, melbourne's like a great place and it's full of things happening it's got a great art scene as clicky and ridiculous as it is um <laughs> same here same yep. movie scene. Yep. um you know it's all happening and we've got cafe culture coming out of our asses you know and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. but we do live in a in a little progressive bubble here where everybody's you know, eco-conscious and 
thinking about issues and all that sort of stuff. But outside of that, like our farmers are killing themselves and struggling, you know, and yeah, all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, probably not nearly as tough as it is for you guys in the U S um, just because we have, small population large wealth huge country so sure you know we're like 22 million or something here in the whole country what's the uh what's the stigma is there a stigma of the occult is that pretty big out there is that still kind of under behind the scenes is it still kind of weird or is it in vogue as it in vogue as it is here now in a way especially among artsy types I actually don't know. Yeah. I, I think among artsy types, there's almost no mention of the occult. Oh, here. Really? It's all, it's all leftist like um, discourse and all postmodern discourse sure. and all that sort of moment. The occult. I don't have much interaction with the occult. Like most of my friends are either musicians or painters, sure, uh, or tabletop role playing geeks. Sure, you yeah. know, yeah. Totally. Um, yeah, so, I was, so yeah, I was wondering if you had like a community at all of, of people you're exchanging kind of that learning process, you know? I, that's why I think I was kind of really excited when I discovered your little podcasting triangle you guys have oh, got yeah. going and Eric and Alex and stuff because I was like, huh, these are the voices I'm looking for. These oh, cool. are the people I want to interact with because I'm just like an isolated entity out here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we're glad to have you. That's awesome. Yeah, we we lucked out. That was a weird, weird happenstance. Oh, I, like I lucked out. <laughs> I just remember going to Google and being like, "Surely there's a podcast on alchemy that's not new agey, that's yeah. intelligent." And I did a bit of search, and up comes my alchemical bromance. And then yep. I hear Eric crapping on about beer, and I thought, oh, <laughs> "This is for me," because I'm yeah. a huge beer nerd. Like well, it's funny. He just, uh, I guess, I was inadvertently his last guest on My Alchemical Romance because yeah. he's now Arnamance. I know. I saw that today. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty funny. Well, at least I got my my Alche- my alchemical, uh, you know, guest appearance before he yeah. changed. But um, I wanted to ask more about yeah, your kind of, you know, you. I saw you forge a what is it a like a Saturn um talisman yeah and like i saw at the very end of the video you had this beautiful chamber of like a uh are you looking at it right now off screen yeah Yeah. (laughs) i could tell and like it's gorgeous and what um what kind of processes are you implementing this talisman with well so that's the first stage of me starting to sneak the occult into my channel yeah yeah start with this being very pigment artist centric Mm -hmm. because i think artists need uh a way in which to get a deeper relationship with their materials so that's part of why i'm doing this but also i'm starting to like i I think i'm going to just get weirder and weirder as things go on yeah why not (laughs) so this is um so when the traditional dutch method for making lead white which was the principal white pigment for eons. You know, it's just it until modern times when we were like having a big freak out about its toxicity, which is fair enough. Right. What they used to do would they would um, make these plates of um, lead and they'd coil it up and they'd put it in clay jars. And at the bottom of the clay jar would be some vinegar. And then they would take that clay jar and they would bury them in mounds of manure. And then over the process of months, it would digest and the lead would transform into a white um, pigment, essentially, through the various chemical transformations going on. And so I thought I would make a more visually interesting version of that process. So at the moment, the lead sitting in that chamber and there's little bowls of acetic acid or vinegar there which are evaporating up and then then hooked into that chamber i've got a fermenter where i'm brewing some gin just because why not and so the gin off gases the carbon dioxide that i need so it's feeding back into the chamber so over time that sigil of satin or the talisman should be eaten away and turned to just a white powder 
Whoa. Yeah, so the it might take about six weeks or longer. Right. Um, and now will you take that um, transmutation? I want to, like, think of a better word because I might no, overuse that. Right. Yeah. Um, are you going to take that and implement it in another process or is that well, kind of in turn, that that resulting mass into a paint and then i'll paint with it right and yeah so i love that that's like exactly so it's almost that the ritual and creating all of this is 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 your um kind of occultish i i don't I hate to use that word it's it's your intentful it's your like your major signature within the like ground of the yeah i think of so art. yeah i love that that's that's amazing to me because that's like that's almost exactly how i approach music in a way is yeah you know no one when they see the finished painting you know i'm sure it'll be beautiful but people will kind of glean just what the visual of the painting is first right and so just having that kind of hidden layer of of intent is is beautiful and are you Will you present it with kind of a the knowledge of that happening? I guess that'll be part of your video too. Yeah, I think so. I'm not yeah. sure. I had this. So uh, last year I was doing work for my graduation show. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was working through a huge amount of ideas because I had to. And I had this sort of realization that the basic model of the alchemical process fit very, very well with the model of what artists are up to, because that's been a big question of mine for a while now is what the hell are we up to? Like, what are we doing? You mean like, like collectively? What yeah. What are artists doing? Like what right. function does art or the creation of art serve? Yeah. Humankind. I struggle like, with but, that. <laughs> yeah, it's a big question because we do it, but right. why? Yeah, what does it what, serve? Yeah. What's the com why are we compelled to create? Mm -hmm. And w w what value does it add to society? Like I I assume like or I it's almost a given that it's necessary. Like art is a necessary requirement of humans. Right. Um but that doesn't answer the question. And yeah. I don't think you can answer the question. Anytime I ask this question when I'm having those like huge, you know, pivotal doubts about, you know, what what the hell any of this means, everyone's like, Oh no, there's gonna always be a place for art and I'm always asking like, but yeah, but like why? Like what? Is it just to entertain? Is it just to is it escapist, you know? Is it is it to document? Like I almost feel that I need to ingest uh, a trade or <laughs> learn something so when the big one hits i'm not just left to talk about how it, the big one affects me through my art yep. you know what i mean so i love the idea of implementing you know just this the craft it's a craft right mm -hmm. and like if you are like what is what do you think you're kind of what is your goal then uh with what what would you like to do upcoming with the processes that you've implemented? Yeah, well, that's a diff that's tough because yeah. I, I actually I'm, I have loosely defined goals. Mm -hmm. and I have short term like practical goals, but ultimately I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Sure, I'm yeah, getting into the great unknown, and that's great. Um, yeah, I think. Ultimately, it's I, I got fed up with the political situation that we're in at the moment, that everybody's fighting everybody as a political voice. Mm -hmm. And I figured there's no point entertaining that argument anymore. The only thing that I can do is bring wonderment back into the world. I, I want to like try and facilitate those moments of awe and engagement and like, yeah, wonderment. Wonderment's yeah. the best word I've got because I like that. for me, the, the good, like the great art that I experience or interact with is the one that fills me with awe. 
Yeah, absolutely. It really moves me, you know, and it's that feeling moved by a piece of art that makes it makes things worth living for. Mm-hmm. You know, and so we're not going to solve our political issues by yelling at each other or having discourse and like there will always be a need for that there's always politics but we will you know we can improve the quality of people's lives through instilling things that genuinely move them and however we can strive to do that i feel is a valuable cause yeah i like that because i think that's what keeps me coming back is you know just flesh out the passion and like just you know uh suspend the suspension if that makes any sense yeah Yeah, and like you getting back into i think you showcasing the process like it is a bit of that because that's what i think that's what i'd like to do is just kind of celebrate the journey more instead of just you know what the what the outcome is because there i don't i don't have an outcome it's not you know it's not that cut and dry and i don't think it should be i think i think there's a place for pretension and i think you know now uh it's almost needed because in and of itself it's you know you're you're intending so much (laughs) when it comes to art and i think the lack of it is in and of itself kind of pretentious but that gentle medium of you know uh showcasing the like life documented within making something is almost more important than what is being made you know yeah it's a balancing act between yeah. those things um as with everything sure yeah 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 i, I think just, the- i get struggled a lot with because uh, I, I i can go the other route too i'll get really obsessed with the minutia you know really yep. obsessed with the assemblage in a way and i could I can lose myself in that and it's yeah that's my struggle <laughs> it's like finding oh, yeah. that yeah that rhythm I, i'm really bad at finishing oh works. yeah yeah i'm great at like starting i'm great at the early initial exploration and obsession mm-hmm. but then six months in of any obsession i usually jump ship to the next one yeah yeah there's that's... like a weird courtship that's like really addictive yeah. you know when you're exploring yeah. an idea and it's not made manifest yet, so you can't have a judgment about it. It's still this like pristine idea of yeah. what could be. Yeah, I can get addicted with that. I've been working on something for like over a decade that now it's like pulling teeth to finish because it's so dear to me as just a, th- a thing that yeah. I'm always going to have to work on, you know, and it feels like a slow death every like page I finish or something, you know? Yeah, well, that it's interesting you say that because this is part of my... I had this sort of epiphany last year while I was doing these paintings and listening to a heap of... Um, do you know James Hillman? I know of him, yeah. Yeah, the, he was a student of Jung's. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has a brilliant set of work on um, psycho- psychological alchemy, Um but he talks a lot about colors. Like he, he had a big obsession with color and its symbolism and all that sort of stuff. But so I had this realization that if you map the alchemical process, so in sort of loose terms of like you start in the negredo, the black phase, and then you move through to the white, mm-hmm. and then you have the yellow and the red, right? I realized that psychologically, and practically speaking artists are working through a similar phase if you sort of and i know this isn't traditional strict alchemy or even spiritual alchemy but this is just the way i see it sure which is i think one of the motivating factors to creating art and this ties back to the mental health thing is we end up in this place of depression right which is the black phase it's this up utmost suffering and despair and we're in this the decay deep, uh, yeah. yeah we're in we're in the, the decaying chasm of death like mm-hmm. we're struggling through things but it's in that place that the motivation to create is born 
yeah as a almost as a, a necessity to get out of that place even if, even though it seems ultimately hopeless when you're there oh yeah i i would go as far as to say that i was addicted to that yeah that entire but, process you know it was like but, needing something to to transpire or needing to, not to transpire but to persevere in yep. a way yeah but that's that's the beauty of the alchemists was they said in order to get anywhere one must make it black you must start in the dark place you cannot just leap to the final work you cannot right. you know you can't skip that stage you have to go through the the exile in the desert and the yep. the, the challenges there but at some point when you're in there you have an epiphany Mm -hmm. you know how you have that artistic epiphany and and that for me was what the the albedo or the whitening stage of things was it's like this blinding light comes down this almost lunatic that's why the moon and right. the white stage associated is you end up in this like this kind of mad clarity where you you've suddenly you know when you see the complete work you know, you see your vision, you like whether it's you're writing a song or coming up with a painting and you see it in its entirety and you're like, aha, that's what I'm going to make. Yeah, absolutely. And the exuberance of that. But almost instantaneously after that happens, doubt kicks in. Yeah. yeah. You pull the floor <laughs> from beneath yourself instantly. You're like, I must be crazy. Right. Like stupid idea or how i'll never be able to make that or why would anyone ever want to see that and all that sort of stuff and instantly that beautiful epiphany that you had is just reduced to doubt and fear and just rubbish again yeah and that's the yellowing that's the decaying of the white mm -hmm. you know think about all the pristine white things that you know whether it's the white pages of a book or white teeth as they they all yellow eventually yeah <laughs> they all okay they all yellow and it's a necessary part so it's synonymous yeah. with you know being weak-willed or callow or yellow. you have to <laughs> self doubt. yeah you have to question your own epiphanies otherwise if you don't they just remain these lofty abstractions that you you dreamed up in the night right and if it goes to actually... straight to red after white you know what does that say well that's the thing so the red is the embodiment for me as like if you put that in the sort of artistic framework that's the production of the work right so so the white is the idea but the red is the physicality it's the painting it's the finished track it's the film it's whatever it is it's the embodied state that is brought into the world but there's that intermediary part of the yellow which is the self-doubt and but it's also the call to action it's the figuring it out so it's like you know when you have that idea and then you go oh shit, how do i actually make that idea happen and you sit down with your pens and your papers and you start working out plans and ideas of how to make it actually come into the world and you realize there's all these problems of how you're actually going to make that work yeah and you have problem solve all of those things and um, before it can actually be reddened properly you have to thoroughly investigate that process and i think part of this like problem with the postmodern conceptual art world is they stop at the white they go i had a great idea i'm going to tell the whole world my great idea but i'm never gonna never gonna work through that difficult phase and actually resolve it as a as a real object as a real thing to present to the world yeah i'm just going to give you my lofty ideas yeah if they stop yeah. at the theory yeah. yeah not the practice and so yeah that's i think a lot of my motivations coming from that place of like uniting both the visceral practice and the the challenge of refining your craft right with your lofty ideas has you know. it i mean you talked about the saturn return so i'm assuming that you've had the you've had altercations along the alchemical path in a way not not only inward but i was wondering if you have have you ran into some like physical like scares working with these 
materials. Uh, I had a, um, so I have pretty, I've had for a very long time, like quite a lot of like, um, sort of physical anxiety and like hypochondria. So mm -hmm. I've always sort of like obsessed over like, my internal state and whether or not I'm anxious and whether or not the physiological feelings I'm feeling are real or whether I I'm just being crazy and I'm a bit of both. Right. Um, <laughs> so the first time I did some work extracting mercury from its ore. Yeah. So, um, which I haven't yet done a video on and I will, um, that was a fascinating process getting the raw cinnabar, which is this beautiful red earth, and using sulfur um, and aluminium to draw out the mercury until you got purified mercury. I was, it was an unbelievably exciting process to do. Yeah, and, and dangerous, to, right? No, it's not really that dangerous. Okay. Um, one, I was working on a very small scale, and two, um, I had all the various safety precautions in sure. place and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But nevertheless, as soon as I finished the process and the the rush of like actually doing it had subsided, I started to get paranoid. Yeah. I thought, oh my God, do I really know what I'm doing? Am I am I a fool? Like I just made mercury and like have, have I poisoned myself? And then just like circles of anxiety wow. started to develop and I started having panic attacks. Um, and I spent two days having these horrific panic attacks and like feeling really dizzy and lightheaded and just completely like, Oh my God, what have I done to myself? I'm an absolute fool. Um, which was, I think the necessary madness. Yeah. The alcohol goes through with mercury. <laughs> um, it turned out I had a, just an ear infection and that's why I was feeling dizzy. Oh, so there was like an actual physical, physiological yeah, yeah, yeah. thing going that's on. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't just so bad. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, um, Go ahead. It was great. It was really funny in hindsight. I was like, oh, I'm such a, I'm so crazy. I'm such a nutter. What a relief, <laughs> you know? It was, a, it was a relief to realize I was just plain old crazy, not right. mercury. Crazy. Neurotic, not psychopathic yeah. yeah 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 it reminds me i had a uh i had a similar thing it's funny how these episodes like these almost like spiritual awakening awakenings always kind of happen in conjunction with something that's probably pretty explainable you know yeah. like i uh i was part of this uh voodoo ritual once and it was like i i had realized later that i had just kind of quit my uh like all my meds and stuff, pretty cold turkey, and didn't think much of it. Did this voodoo ritual that was like insane to me and like completely just earth shattering. And I got really sick because I didn't ground myself well or something after this ritual. But it could be explained away as this, you know, physiological detox almost of. Of oh, yeah. all the, but at the same time, every uh, major thing I have in my life that's like that could also probably be explained away in some physiological thing. I don't, I don't know what that is or what, uh, you know, what my point is in bringing that up or, or noticing that synchronicity. But oh, no. it, it's funny you say things that could be explained away. Mm -hmm. um, I've been noticing this this trend on some of the like alchemy Facebook groups and things like that, which I've sort of tried to interact with to see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And there's this weird miss, like mismatch between like people thinking that like science just explains things away sure. or thinking that like unhinged new age thinking is the only way to approach things. And Right. It's like, of course, science can explain things away. Right. That's what it does. Yeah. It, it's a literalization of the world. It's like, there's this, I think James Hillman brings up this great moment. He's like, there was no such thing as litter until Descartes. <laughs> He's like, Descartes invented dead matter. Before that, the world was insolved and full of things. And you knew the world through its qualities and its stories and its narratives and its archetypes. Right. And... And it's like, yeah, okay, science 
can explain things away, but science should be viewed as like a razor sharp scalpel. It's a good tool. It's a useful tool. Right. It, it's only a tool. Yeah. The story that we overlay on top of that, that, that exists in our like psyche or our conscious experience, that's just as much a true reality as the like quantitative um, scientific reality. Right. They don't need to be at opposites with each other. They just need to integrate in a like a, a proper way. Each has their place. Right. And like, yeah, my idea, I'm never coming from a strictly skeptic or, you know, quote unquote mm. rational mindset in that I think more so I'm, I'm uh, noticing kind of the riddle, you know, the funny yeah. uh, synchronous thing that, of course, it's almost like it was um, engineered you know these things to happen coincidentally at the same time or that contradiction is like the the whole point you know <laughs> it's that you'll yeah, have yeah. this magnanimous spiritual moment but it'll be you know it'll coincide with this you know physical uh issue or symptom you know and yeah, it yeah. seems to always be that way but yeah I, I get what you're saying i wonder um how i guess this would come back into a little bit about uh, what we were talking about earlier, you know, with the colleges and all that. But I do see uh, this, this, there's this need to be overly rational or this overtly uh, skeptical. And like you were saying, there's also this, you know, people are saying to go full woo with things, yeah. you know, and without, I was talking to somebody recently and it seems the problem is, is the more you get to learn these things, the more you study and the more you uh, notice these certain things, none of it is, you know, obvious. None of it is explainable either way all the time. Right. And I was wondering if you've had um, situations in your life and on, on your road where it shattered kind of your, uh, rational thinking or your woo thinking either way. Hmm. Yeah. <sighs> I have to think about that. Yeah. We can circle back. I know it's kind of a loaded question. Yeah. But, but, but in terms of that, that balancing act between being overly rational or, you know, so open that all ideas are fair game. Right. <laughs> Like I was having this argument with a friend of mine the other day who's way more rational than I am. Like he's a lawyer and all that sort of stuff. Sure. And he was, he made some scoff remark about how like the Bible presents a good, like practical manual for wrestling angels <laughs> in terms of Jacob wrestling the angel. And he's like, it's so ridiculous. And I'm like, I instantly sort of stepped in and was just like, there's no way people saw that well not necessarily no way but i highly doubt that people saw jacob wrestling with the angel as a manual on how to wrestle an angel right <laughs> right it's literal yeah it's a metaphor because if you think about when you interact with an angel which is a higher principle you wrestle with a higher principle yeah like you don't you don't just like enter the space of angels and get illuminated and have a great time it's no that's a hard place to enter yeah yeah but, you know you, you know what it's like to wrestle with these these higher ideals or these spiritual moments they're they're never pleasant journeys even if they're full of euphoria they're still challenging oh yeah absolutely and that's why jacob's in the desert when he's wrestling the angel it's like no right. he's in the way you know this is the conflict this is the uh the like <clears throat> the apex you know it's i love that picture it paints though it's 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 beautiful and it seems like it's always uh so translatable you know just uh hearing all these different vectors kind of together where it's you know these archetypes where you know if it's the setting and then the angel in yeah. the desert and and that shit just it transcends you know and what you were yeah. talking about you know, earlier with stories and these narratives and finding this connective tissue, I think the Bible is sorely overlooked in that sense, you know, especially yeah. in, in this community. I do have friends. I have a friend that just became a, a, a pastor, actually, who started out as like a Enochian uh, magician. So yeah. he kind of he went 
extreme to it, but I'm seeing a, a bit of a, a, a reverence, I think, for the alchemical side of, you know, what the biblical story is, you know, little well, by if little. You, if you look at alchemy pre-Christianity, it's... Um, it's a lot more of a craft and also a paganistic sort of symbol system. Right. And if you look at it post Christianity, like most of the Renaissance uh, and Baroque alchemists were deeply Christian. Like they were all working within a Christian framework. Right. Um, they were heretics of course, but um, even the Christian church to some degree acknowledges the necessity of a heretic. Like, good <laughs> yeah maybe less so these days or right less you know but at one stage or another the heretic was a as an essential function of of spiritual development and you know they update dogma essentially yeah absolutely test the limits and the bounds right yeah yeah do you have a uh, daily practice like outside of say the meditative you know ritualistic art of making these pigments and, and whatnot do you have a yeah do you have a daily practice to kind of get your psychic self out there at the moment i don't mm -hmm. except when i'm working yeah which so, is a huge one i mean that's you know that's not to be swept under the rug i think that's a major practice when when i was in you know, in the, the new agey group, I would meditate, you know, two, three hours a day kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so I did a lot of that. And I think I'm still internally a bit disenfranchised with all of that stuff. Yeah. And I'm still trying to figure out what I actually want from it. Yeah. You know, where I was at in that group, you know, we had a guru and we had all that crap. Oh, and really? Yes. It was, a, it was, a, I would, I would almost say it was verging on cult. Okay. Right. But, um, Is it, it a popular a good... one or? Uh, no, not really. There's only about 50,000 people worldwide that do it. That's a big one. Most... There's a, there's a community in Asheville that, that are big. Yeah. Oh, cool. In... Okay. Yeah. I'm always interested in those. I just, I'm always interested in the subscription or the idea of subscribing to something and yeah. following something that suit yeah. not that i think it's wrong or or look down upon it it's just it's always fascinated me you know because i think yeah people people like the direction you know yeah i think i'm suspicious of anyone who comes to you with a plan of of, of answers yeah and in a way to get there because that's that's never going to be the case right like um like, I think I like the notion of trust people's description of phenomena, not their interpretation. Oh, I like so, that. What's that from? Oh, I have I, I an old adage. Where, but it, it's essentially this idea that when people tell you the stories of what happened to them, they're usually telling the truth, whether it's UFOs took me or, right. you know, I had angels come down. It's like, their description of what they saw and experienced is usually true. Mm -hmm. Their interpretation of why they think it happened or what they think was happening is what's usually a confabulation of yeah. some sort. It's like the old Art Bell rule with uh, yeah. Coast yeah. to Coast. Yeah, just believe yeah. believe everything that they're telling you, you know, that yeah. from their experience. Yeah, I like yeah. that. I think there's a lot of beauty in that. And I think... I don't know, recently uh, this has come up a lot because I have friends that are kind of writing texts and are verging into areas of uh, struggling with their knowledge of agnosticism or like the, you know, um, uh, the, the idea of everything being agnostic, you know, the kind of, um, what you would call it, yeah, I would just say it was like a, you know, the the Robert Anton Wilson style in in the sense of, you know, every question, everything, belief systems are, are BS, all that stuff. And yet they're writing these uh, materials in this faction, knowing this and having a terrible time, not trying to come off as uh, directorial or like 
ordering or giving people an answer and having yep. to tell people that you know this is what worked for me this is this is my experience and i've had i've had friends like really struggling with this because i feel that this is the hard part in this uh area of the you know the occult or alchemy is that people want quick answers and they want to be you know told quickly how to service something or get something within themselves and they don't want to hear most of the time the true answer which is you know it <laughs> whatever works for you kind of you know it's not there's no blanket idea of how to get there and so are you, are you familiar with terence mckenna of course yeah yeah I, I love his sort of statement of like we need to get used to living without closure yeah exactly he's like thing is like he you know a mystery or a see like he a mystery is not a secret that hasn't been told yet a mystery is a secret that can't be told right you know it's that whole thing of like but so this sort of harks back to what we were saying before about balance between the rational and the irrational it's the same with what you're saying about having conviction in what you're saying and what you're teaching mm -hmm. uh, and you know not becoming dogmatic about it right but at the same time the opposite which is the postmodern condition which is that because everything can be interpreted ah. every possible way, there's no meaning it's like that's not helpful right yeah postmodernism makes a correct analysis of the state of affairs mm -hmm. but it doesn't offer a, a remedy yeah. It's concluding that everything is meaningless is not helpful to anyone at all. That's true. I mean, yeah, in a sense, though, I, I understand the idea of the pharmacon, you know, or the like the poison and the antidote in a way as just kind of being a truism with a lot of things. But you're right. I mean, that's maddening in a way. It's not. It and it's not. Yeah, there's there's no need to um, express that or there's no need to like celebrate that it's almost an obvious truism it, it, yeah it's yeah. the state of affairs but it's not helpful right what we need to end up is this we need to straddle this this like that you know that you know between the yin and the yang you've got that that line between it which is supposed to be a river of mercury well yeah uh, we have to straddle that balance between order and chaos or you know in terms of like academic or teaching or learning as you were talking about with friends of yours struggling it's this process where you don't want to be too reductive with right. what you're doing and this is the definition of how things are and you don't want to be too um open about it and say well this is my interpretation but you may have a different response and we can't be entirely certain because then you end up in a sea of chaos yeah yeah, and you're not true. really saying much then because there's not yeah yeah then if everything's just left to an yeah. interpretation there's nothing really being said in a way yeah you need to have a foot in both camps of yeah. order and chaos otherwise you you get lost yeah or you get good so how would you what what have you found what texts what writers have you found straddle that well um well, I, as I said, I really like Terence McKenna. Yeah. I think, like, as crazy as he is, oh, I love and it. The whole time wave thing was a complete <laughs> 2012. That was that was nutty, and he knew it. Well, That's yeah, I guess in a way, though, like I've definitely had a major transmutation in 2012, but that's anecdotal, you know. Well, no, I think we had a technological shift. Yeah, like the internet exploded around that time social media exploded there was in a way an end of history right no it wasn't completely off i definitely he felt just, you know there was a shift for me to a major one during that time and also it wasn't like cern turned on the maybe hydron yeah. collider and stuff yeah it's funny we'll have some terminator coming back through that oh, soon enough. God. Sure. yeah if we don't eat, our, eat ourselves first you know <laughs> so like my influences for this sort of how i ended up here was i started really getting exposed to alchemical ideas through terence mckenna even though his interpretation of alch alchemy is not academically rigid right uh oh, sorry not rigid rigorous um he still has some really interesting ideas around it, and he has some great lectures on it 
Yeah. Uh, I feel like and it's, then, it's very hermetic, too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He loved hermeticism. He loved Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. And that was a really good start point for me to be like, ah, oh, okay, you know, I can go through the kind of footnotes of Terence McKenna and try and find the Corpus Hermeticum, find these yep. things and start reading them. Um, but really, I think ultimately jung and james hillman have had the biggest impact on me yeah um but the thing to be careful with jung is jung was a i, I love this idea that while the 60s counter culture revolution was happening in san francisco with all the drugs you had at the same time in switzerland you had albert hoffman creating lsd and you had jung creating the unconscious right so and all the Jungian ideas got imported into the new, into the, the just after the summer of love stuff and kickstarted this new wave of like new age spiritual thinking. So, so much of what we've inherited from the new age is directly a result of Jungian style. Totally. Of Joseph Campbell and all that sort of stuff. But almost like watered down and appropriated. And yes. In a lot so of we have to remember that, Jung could read ancient Greek, he could read Latin, and so he could read all, and he read everything. Like, if you check his footnotes, they're just, like, pages and pages of footnotes of original source texts. Right. So he's read everything that Western spirituality has created. He's read every church father, every Gnostic text, every alchemical text. So he knows what he means when he says stuff. But the the future generations who have picked up like second or third hand Jungian analysis on alchemy, they've become so we forget that Jung is Jung. Right. You know, that it's coming through a funnel. Yeah. Yeah. And so I read his stuff and as much as I love his stuff, I know that that's not his interpretation is not entirely what the alchemists were actually up to. <laughs> he's just amalgamated it for his purpose to fit within his world model. Right. It's not to say he didn't understand what they were up to. Right. He also has an agenda and I like his agenda, mm -hmm. but you know, it's yeah. So, it's in the sense you can't say that, you know, you're a hermeticist because you've read the Kabbalion or, you know yeah. what I mean? I guess in yeah, that yeah. way. Yeah. So I guess going to the source is what you're advocating a little more. Um, no, not necessarily like read Jung and appreciate what his insights were, but don't take that as the, the only way of viewing alchemy. Right. I feel like we hit kind of a threshold too of a cult of personality in a sense yes. with a lot of these thinkers and quote unquote mystics, you know, oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, it's like this, uh, indoctrination of, you know, the figurehead and certain ideas and people forget that, yeah, they're humans that are transposing a lot of these, you know, or yeah. I guess just, yeah, filtering down a lot of these ideas. Are there any others that come to mind when you think of, have there been any that have, I don't want to like cast shade, you know, but have there been any, maybe even modern thinkers writers that you feel are kind of setting us back a little bit in in these functions oh i don't i don't know That's yeah the problem because i might yeah that was kind of a a push because yeah i'd rather not i don't know be negative i just mean to say if they're to kind of paint a picture of what the limits are you know what i mean in specifically in terms of alchemical thinking alchemical just... thinking yeah yeah i really don't know what people want from alchemy at the moment sure. like it's coming back but mm -hmm. a lot of my experience and not to be too negative to these people because i'm also interacting with them but like right, right. a lot of the experience i've had online with through the reddit sub alchemy reddit and like you know the facebook pages and stuff like that is either people are purely interested in spiritual alchemy right or there's a few very strange individuals who think that they can literally produce the stone still oh really you know? yeah 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 or they say and, they yeah 
I've been getting some weird messages online since <laughs> stuff like people being like, can you make me this thing with mercury or can you explain to me how this thing works? And I'm just like, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Do you, you think, know? Yeah. Do you think, have you seen any um, relation to the kind of like, I guess not so much herbology, but in other sections of magical practice, you know, the using of different minerals and, and and have yes. you seen correlation? Is there like a good understanding you've seen in some of these practices of what they're working with? I think, again, I think well, that's the other area of alchemy that's most popular at the moment. And right. that's a Jirix herbalist tincture thing. Mm -hmm. Like I think for most people who want to get their hands dirty with doing alchem like alchemical work, they're more comfortable working with doing herbal alchemy like alcohol extractions and distillation and stuff like that than they are getting a chunk of lead and right. some mercury and fucking around with that because <laughs> nobody wants to do that except me because i'm a nutter i love it um, yeah behind me i've got like these guys like this is a solid chunk of cadmium oh my god that weighs about half a kilo and this is a big old chunk of lead <laughs> incredible shelf here i love that what a good setup and then here we've got the mercury crazy which is just insane yeah that's like you're right i guess there are um you know there are stigmas about mercury you know that still permeate from when i was a kid oh it's toxic stuff yeah. but it's in its elemental form it's not as bad as you'd think Oh, that's awesome. The salt, it's it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> Mercury chloride or those sorts of things that they, they, they'll yeah. And the cyanide that you were working with, is that like was that was oh, a different that, type of cyanide, right? It's not the that was, um when I was making Prussian blue. So that's what yeah. That's um potassium ferrocyanide. So what that is is um the cyanide is locked in a lattice of iron molecules. And so the cyanide is not dangerous because it's so entrenched inside the iron it's it, that it can't get out. So yeah. it's not actually dangerous. That's cool, though. Is it's there a uh, like a, a, a word or a tradesman term for a pigment maker? In the past, it would have been called a colorman. Colorman. Yeah. Okay. That would have been in, like, the Impressionist period. Sure. Um before that it would have most artists would have had they would have gone to an apothecary or mm. a druggist or an alchemist to get their stuff in yeah. like the renaissance very cool so you would have picked stuff up from different people and then you would have had your apprentices grind up your paints each morning for you very cool yeah so that's how it used to work um i don't know if i have it close by but there's a great book called the um, Craftsman's Handbook that was written in the 14th century, and it goes through all the various like processes for making your materials from your brushes to your canvases to all of the things. And it's just ridiculous. They're like, you know, if you want to make a bone black pigment, just look under your table for, you know, a chicken bone, pick up the chicken <laughs> bone from under your table, place it in the fire like this. And it's just like, oh, yeah, because in the 14th century, people would just had bones under their table. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> are there so, any other like modern artists or people that are that you've noticed are taking as much care or are, you know, uh, being as intentful with this process as you are? Um, so I'm really lucky that here in Melbourne, we have a paint making company that I'm fr like beginning friends with the owner and he takes a lot of care into the paint that he makes. And he's done a few exhibitions and just released a book about the history of color and pigments. Cool. And stuff. Yeah. So when he's less busy, I'm going to do some collaborating with him and discuss some things like that. So there are people around the world, right? So for a lot of this stuff, it's either the pigments are made in Europe by people who have been doing it for hundreds of years and they keep their secrets super guarded, mm -hmm. or they're made in China in giant factories completely and personally. Right. That's, That's what I assumed most of it was. Yeah. Yeah. So 
so that's that's kind of the state of affairs and we're we're moving away from the historical pigments to very high performance um petrochemical based pigments wow so most modern pigments are derived from like petroleum or organic chemistry mm-hmm. um and completely synthetic and but they are less toxic so there is an advantage there well, that's cool yeah um how have you i guess like yeah my kind of last question it's kind of a big one how has this process translated into your like everyday life how how are you uh being affected when you're not creating these colors you know like are you looking at the world in an especially different way or is is everything a bit more meditative in a sense because you're seeing it in this alchemical idea I've always looked super intently at the world in terms of its colors. Yeah. Uh, it's been a long obsession of mine. And that's, as you, you asked before, like, what are my goals with this? And, like, part of it is to really bring people into that deeper relationship to color and its symbolism. Because I think as the world has modernized, we have way more color in it than we ever had before. And we're oversaturated. Like I get, yeah, actually, you know, the thing that's really changed for me is actually a negative reaction, not a positive reaction, which is I am, I'm noticing how bombarded we are by color as we walk around like magazine covers and posters and TV screens and neon lights. It's just like, like constantly in your face, hyper color too. Like, right. Nature doesn't necessarily produce color in the tones that modern plastic world has. And so it's, it's actually, I'm trying to figure out how to, because we've become desensitized to color because we used to know the world through color. Like, and I think that was another great alchemical dictum is like a change of color is a, change of essential nature Mm -hmm. so you know when when you look at a human skin we know the health and the condition they're in based on the color of like how it is you know yellowing are you pale are you overly red like you can tell the health of someone through the color you tell in nature whether something is dangerous or attractive through color right like it's a super important psychological mechanism for navigating the world but now that, and and like we used to color our objects in ways that was meaningful, if that makes sense. Like the reason something was colored a particular way had symbolic Im- implications. Sure. Now we, now your garden chair is uh, bright green or bright blue, or you know your whisk. Why is your like you know your, or your cooking utensils? Why are they bright yellow or red or blue or you know? Sure. There's no there's no reason or method to it. It's just like plastic things can be whatever color you want, as bright as you want. Yeah. I feel that we've become really desensitized to the potential relationship we can have with color because we're just bombarded. It's also and, like psychological tactics, right? And color coding yeah. and, you know, oh my God. fast food shit with yellow and red and inciting yeah. hunger. And, and yeah, it gets, it gets creepy in that sense. And I guess, yeah, it's something that I've I've always kind of noticed that maybe there there is an intent to color things, but it's kind of nefarious in its way to do oh, so. It's yeah, it's huge manipulative yeah. of uh, like because I, I I really think that like color symbolism is one of the oldest forms of symbolism that we have because as I said, it's how we knew the world, like you know it's almost i would say it predates our relationship to like star symbolism like you know mapping of astrological symbolism and stuff like that because you know even in like before in primate form like think about how all, all the animals know the world through their interaction with the colors of things right and so when advertisers use color to manipulate us, they're hitting us on very deep old circuits in the brain and we aren't capable of registering the fact that we've been manipulated by color. Yeah. 
how i guess sorry i'm gonna ask you one more question because it just incited me um in a lot of the psychedelic or you know otherworldly uh psychic spelunking that i've done color has been a magnanimous source of notifying me of you know the the realms of the neither neither the strange you know areas i'm entering in and almost sometimes the lack of color and like these meditations i've i've done uh this one that i've continued to do recently the you know the kabbalistic tree of life and the different spheres you know and in each one really signified by a color now that i think of it or the absence of color you know um how it always kind of reminded me that you know uh, what we see in this somatic reality is is uh, this certain resolution and these agreed upon colors of this certain resolution of 2020 and you know the sky being yeah. blue and all of that. Do you think that there's something to be said about you know these uh, transdimensional wayfaring uh, is something as easy as kind of changing the color of how you see things or do you think there's a big correlation or something that you know kind of simple when it comes to kind of shocking us out of this shared somatic thing as you know color are you you so you sort of talking about how this the hyperdimensional space is hyperdimensionally colored yes and 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 I guess yeah. even so, yeah, because even um, I guess a textbook, like when I had started meditating deeply, um, I would see, you know, these purple tetrahedrons and yeah. and then you, I'd go on to find and have that corroborated that, you know, oh, people have seen these and stuff. And I just I want to know if like if you think that color is universal in that sense that it's, you know, it's always signifying i guess yeah do you get what i'm trying to say that like yeah, yeah. It, yeah it's it's somatic almost transdimensionally in a way it's shared you know yeah so there was a um study done in the 60s on color terms mm-hmm. through all languages and cultures and so they did an analysis of as many languages as they could find both ancient and current for the terms that they had for colors. And they found that if a language, because not all languages have terms for all colors necessarily in the way that we use in English, for example. So if a language had any terms at all for color, it would all, the first two that they would have that was universal among all languages was light and dark. They always had that differentiation. If they had a third term for color, it was always red, mm-hmm. right? If they had a fourth term for color, it was um, either yellow or green. Okay. And if they had a fifth term, which some languages don't have a fifth term, it would be blue. So there is this universal progression among humans to differentiate between light and dark yeah. and develop symbolic relationships to light and dark. Just think about all of spirituality and esoteric thinking is all about lightness or darkness and so forth then we have red which is obvious because of the sun because of blood because of the earth like it's it's a universal state and symbol system as well and then blue uh sorry yellow green again is another universal so i think color symbology and states of that relationship between as you said somatic experiences of color I think they are like archetypal in that sense. Yeah. And I think like different languages deal with color in different ways, you know, like I think English is one of the stranger languages in the sense that we have terms for colors that are abstracted. So we have like things like teal sure. or you know mauve and it's like those aren't real things whereas like if you go to other languages they'll have like they won't have a term like brown They'll have like bird shit brown, <laughs> right. you know, or like three bark four black. things. Yeah. So yeah. Their, their descriptions of colors are what things are actually of that color. Right. As opposed to, you know, we sit here and we talk about yellowness. It's like, what kind of yellow? Are we right. talking about 
the golden, beautiful yellow of daisies or the sun, or are we talking about putrefied flesh? Right. Or pus? You know, pus yellow is disturbing in comparison <laughs> to, you know, the beautiful golden yellow of the sun. You're right. You there know? is a gradient of interpretation, an extreme yeah. gradient of interpretation, I guess. Too. You almost can't talk about color without relating it to a physical object. Right. You can talk about red, but people go, what kind of red? And you go, Ferrari red, fire truck red, right. flame red. Like, there's always a, an attached physical body to the color term. Yeah. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Have you noticed, I'm sorry, I'll keep you up for a little bit longer. I just wanted to ask if you on uh, some of your, uh, not necessarily psychedelic, but maybe in you know in dreams and in, in certain otherworldly or... What I say, transdimensional wayfaring to be pretentious about it. If you like, have you yeah. noticed that the colors uh, stay consistent or do you notice that there's a shift or what has some, you know, some people, you know, I've heard dream in black and white. And I wonder what, you know, psychologically or even spiritually what that could incite. But I think I dream in black and white yeah. for a large which is weird considering my life's about color. I mean, it um, kind of makes sense because uh, yeah. it's, it's almost an escapist idea in a way. Oh, I really like gray. Gray yeah. is actually my favorite. Me too. Of all. Um, yeah. The thing that gives depth to color. Mm -hmm. like it's the necessary um, almost reprieve from the intensity. Yeah. Paint to... that gray are too much. Right. To me, it's um, that perfect symbol of the contradiction or, you know. Yeah light and dark yeah exactly but yeah in terms of color between different altered states and stuff like that like i have experienced reasonable amounts of sort of colorful experiences but i i i'm not sure whether there's necessarily coherency across the board with them right um my most vivid recollection was i was this is a weird digression, but so I was per perched on the precipice of this waterfall, like just a little waterfall um, in a river. Mm -hmm. And so sitting in, in the water with like one foot was calm water and the other side was all turbid water and I was tripping. Mm -hmm. And I remember just closing my eyes and there was just an infinite amount of, um, caterpillars both you know, like blue and yellow caterpillars flowing into each other and the sound of the water led to these these caterpillars were just clapping with joy yeah. as they were more into each other but i've never seen a more vivid blue or more vivid yellow in my whole life than that that experience of being literally between order and chaos and having this like parade of caterpillars cheering me on are they and, uh complete opposites in the uh, color spectrum is there a significance to the blue and yellow you think they're not actually yeah. complete like i mean i, um, I kind of i knew that but i just meant like is it yeah it was there a significance? Why. yeah I, okay I, I, but it was fascinating to watch yeah that's cool super yeah. cool because i know like in the experiences i've had there's a, a commonality between a shift in tone when yep. I've hit those states, it's almost, you know, I yeah. get sepia toned on a certain thing and on another thing, it's, it's more of a blue, you know, analog yeah, think, versus digital kind of weird. Yeah. I think now that you mention it, I can start to like, I'm getting these sort of memories coming back where it's like, yeah, there are definite shifts in hue. Yeah. That place. I couldn't tell you the exact qualities of them, but yeah. And the emotional states fluctuate the hues fluctuate yeah it's just it's always fascinating with for me because i remember as a kid reading carlos castaneda and he talks about and one of the teaching don juan and i know that uh since then it's been kind of controversial because i don't i don't know how much of it was actually true but he talks about the uh, the devil's weed and if you smoke it you see one of two colors and either the your atmosphere shifts red and you die immediately or it shifts like black into darkness and you enter this void. And that yeah. always, I always thought was kind of synonymous, not to that extreme, obviously, but of a lot of, you know, shifts in consciousness. It was always color signified in a way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. 
you just got me on a color switch. I love it. Yeah, well, that's, that's the point. And I, I'm constantly probing people around me and being like, what do you think of this color? Like, yeah. tell me what it does to you because, yeah, you know, and people always, like, you know, as a kid, you always got to ask that question, like, what's your favorite color? You know, and totally. it's like, whoa, you know, that's, that's a big question. I can tell you that gray is not a popular answer. <laughs> you like yeah. gray? Yeah. I used yeah, to get that all the time. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, man, I thank you so much, Jeremy. It's so good to meet you. Finally. Yeah, likewise. I, I, as I said, like, when I discovered you guys, like, online and just started listening and just thinking, gee, there is this community of people who are willing to authentically discuss their experiences with this sort of stuff. And they have, again, that balance between being critical of the process and uh, critical thinking about what they're doing, but also being open to the mystery. Oh yeah. It's like, that's, that's what I, I want more dialogue for people to have. Yeah. You know, I want people to, to approach this sort of stuff with, with their, their intellect intact, but their heart sort of open to possibility. Yeah. Because, and so it was a real breath of fresh air. Well, thank and, you. Yeah, that means everything. I'm, it's it's definitely not something that was intended, but I think was just an absolute natural goal in a way. You know, got to just be honest with this shit. You know, who are we kidding? <laughs> yeah, well, I really enjoy. Like, I was just listening, uh, I think yesterday, to your talk with um, Mitch Horowitz. Mm-hmm. And I was like, when he was talking about the transparency thing online, the name, yeah, you know, yeah, and I was like, yeah, that's great. Like, that's a really good, good. Like, that was a good discussion on that sort of stuff. And the episode that you did with um, Alex and Aaron? on, yeah, on 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 depression and mental health and all yeah. that sort of stuff. That was a really informative episode. Like, yeah. I really liked that, like, the conclusion. I, I really liked how much time you guys spent talking about snacking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and I really liked You can the, tell our age, like, you know, I, when that's our issue is snacking. Yeah, no, my issue is snacking <laughs> too. And I, I agree that uh, the whatever's going to cure us will be some sort of donut-shaped hole that we need filling, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, totally. I only work a couple of days a week in the evenings, but every night after I finish work, I always get a couple of donuts and just go home, smoke a joint, and just cram donuts in my mouth till I feel better. Yeah, it's like it's the only thing I have left, you know? It's funny. <laughs> it, and it's not that I'm like, I was intentionally trying to quit so much, so many things or stop yeah. smoking in a way. It's just been this thank god natural progression but it's like i can't find solace easy anymore yeah. <laughs> you know? and now it's i'm toning down so that shift of like maybe i should just go get some ice cream it's like no i don't even fucking want that anymore like what do i have yeah. left you know <laughs> it's frustrating because i'm i'm trying to like cut down like smoking so much pot every night yeah video games and maybe i need video games i think that's probably what it is i need some yeah, sort right. of like outward exercise and not just you know physical but i mean just a a complete displacement of myself would probably be good yeah (laughs) but yeah that toning back of like consumption of um distracting mindsets like getting high is great for generating new ideas Mm -hmm. but ultimately it's also a good like distraction yeah you know reprieve to just chill out and not have your brain just be on overload yeah for me it's the opposite but i would say that was kind of like what drinking has been for me and that you know if i don't get high i feel like i should be working yeah (laughs) yeah so it's like an automatic shift to relaxation yeah yeah i like that relax it's just like i don't know what to do yeah i should should be doing academic things i should be practicing you know it's just yeah like, then the stress of productivity yeah yeah and it's like no you can't be 100 produ- percent productive all the time yeah otherwise yeah what the hell are you doing i think that's what i'm learning i think my big takeaway has just been you know it's it's hackneyed but you know in a way it's presence and just kind of 
uh, just really enjoying sitting with that feeling in a way of reminding yourself of like how not dire shit is, you know, like I need to yeah. do something with myself. It's like, it doesn't matter. No one gives a fuck. Chill out, you know, yeah. <laughs> in a way yeah. that's been my mantra is no one gives a fuck. And it's just been calming, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of preparing to, to, to enter that space of, being comfortable with just being yeah. as opposed to obsessed with doing. I think that's that's the surrender part. It's not even like you know what I mean? It's just like I give up. I give up fighting with myself. Like I'm always going to be the worst <laughs> when it yeah. comes to myself. So kind of, yeah, it's humor in a way, you know, laugh at it. I, I think I'm really indignant to that at the moment too because so much of what happened in that new agey sort of group that I was in was all like surrender, surrender yeah. to God. Surrender the most, and I'm like, I'm not gonna fucking surrender to shit. Word. I've got a plan. Yeah, I know. I used to, I used to keep, like, I used to revere being stubborn. Thought it was, you know what I mean. And I still do to a degree. I, I, I think that aspect of me is funny in a lot of ways. But I've yeah, definitely yeah. fell into the foul swoop of it for yeah. for long periods. You know, of just that incessant fuck you quality that I have. <laughs> Yes. to like not, myself and outside of you're not going to tell me what to do but especially i'm not going to tell myself what to do yeah. <laughs> but yeah no this has been good i really enjoyed this yeah thank you so much man it's great to meet you and let's do this again i mean we i feel like i've only hit the surface yeah i feel like i like like just general nerves was harder to get the flow of conversation but as we went on it just became more natural and that sort of stuff which I yeah. enjoyed. Cool, man. And yeah, this yeah. won't be the last time. Yeah, no, definitely. I'd love to come back and keep doing this. I also had some crazy ideas for the in the future. I'm wanting to do because I'm really into technology, um, as well as all of this archaic stuff. And I really want to get into uh, making VR versions of what I'm doing. But I want to bring the camera inside the experiments so this, yeah yeah so this crazy idea of like being inside all of the transmutation and making these sort of video collages of like all these weird processes happening and i would really love in the future if you'd be interested in collaborating with your music and textural sounds with these crazy vr worlds that oh I my god create. yeah I, absolutely that would be that's like that's a dream i would love to do something like that yeah cause i think virtual reality is going to become a big art form yeah and i think for like weird occult practices and magical like hi, like hyper sigils as you call them yeah yeah real possibility to make some strange worlds i love it i'm coming around to it i've been struggling recently kind of finding that gentle balance <laughs> between being overly uh, having technology kind of drive so much of my day and, oh yeah you know what i mean uh, yeah. and yeah my i'm 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 coming around to understanding like w what my relationship needs to be with it and i think something like that really would inspire me to you know like investigate and to be you know almost adventurous that's, with it that's the weird thing with technology like here we are talking on the other side of the world i know it's insane yeah. I'm, you're like you're tomorrow right now yeah. you're my tomorrow yeah. that's insane <laughs> yeah you know we all carry around like a smartphone in our pocket that's like like 100 times more powerful than the best computer 30 years ago oh yeah and all we use it for is like angry twitter messages and candy crush yep and looking at memes of dogs oh god like, yeah you know and it's like you have one of the most powerful tools in your pocket that humanity has like an alchemist in the 15th century would kill for one of these things. Oh yeah. I love it. You look at any science fiction or hard sci-fi yep. 10 years ago and no one thought about carrying a supercomputer on every person. Yep. You know, they wanted flying cars and all this, you know, kind of, and it's hilarious that that is way more advanced than anything we could have yeah. ever dreamed of but it's also kind of arrested us to, you know well, i think where our technology precedes our emotional development yeah like we have more sophisticated technology than we are like we are not 
emotionally sophisticated enough to know how to use it yeah i mean it's true for me absolutely yeah yeah um it it's really negative uh emotionally mm -hmm. like the impact of it but the the abilities so that's where i want to start you know once i get this sort of stuff rolling on like a good rhythm with the videos and like stuff like that yeah then i'm going to start exploring some sort of more out there i love stuff. it yeah, and yeah. cuz you know, I think more so I'm talking about social media because you know, with the music and my albums and that whole process, yeah. it's very technologically based. In a in a way, it's almost a you, span of between analog and digital, you know, production you and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's and you know, I have knowledge. I I use I use it as a tool, as a you know, digital alchemy in a way you know to yeah. create create art but i, I want to get back to i'm i'm thinking about taking all my albums off of streaming and just going like straight into printing again and doing short run mm -hmm. stuff and and kind of matching it that way you know what i mean I, yeah that's the tough that's the tough thing because like i i really love buying vinyl yeah when i have to be and, and i know I, that's it's expensive that's yeah and I had, I still had a cassette Walkman up until like 2010. Yeah. And like, you know, I, I, I resisted getting MP3 player forever because I love tape. Yep. Um, but it's that weird balance between like all art is to be found on social media. So if you're not there with the rest of the party, you get lost. But then before all of that existed, people still had their work yeah. out there. You know, yeah, I almost feel like I'm already lost in the shuffle. It's like I almost feel yeah. like in a way I would be gaining more personally and creatively just to go the complete opposite direction, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like maybe there is a need for that reaction to to realize that social media is not the make or break of your career that right. there are analog and organic forms of getting your work out there. Yeah. And maybe social media is just a place for these kinds of discussions. Yeah. Also, you know, there's something to be said about interactive art and, you know, doing yep. uh, I have a friend that's cr creating like music with little games, you know, yep. like eight bit games. And I love that. And like your VR, VR idea. So I think that's a beautiful prospect for it. Yeah. But I think just that whole, you know, creating something, putting all that time and energy in to be played on a website and you know what I mean? Just, and that's all it kind of does or it goes to streaming platforms and is not yeah. really like made it's manifest in a way? It just kind of lives in this circuit, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's part of my, like, so like I, I haven't really like promoted it yet, but I have like all other others. I have a Patreon as well. Oh yeah. Um, but part of my thing with Patreon, like I noticed with a lot of people, the only thing, like I know it's just people are happy to just donate for the fact that people still just keep creating, but like the reward system that people would often offer in Patreon was just like either early access to videos or like all of the junk that they didn't decide to put in the main videos that they're releasing you guys. Right, the unedited. <laughs> Um, yeah. other thing yep i'm guilty of that in a way for sure well yeah we all are because yeah. we offer something more but like i've made a really strong stance with my reward tiers in there have been like if you subscribe i'm gonna send you pigments i'm gonna send you stuff like Very little samples because cool. i want you to have something physical yeah as you're saying with like your music you want something physical or tangible rather than just this like digital sphere of right it's it's literally just an idea it's a, it's a crazy yeah. interactive idea if it's just in the computer but yeah, yeah we were doing that with we the hollowed you know we were like creating zines and trying to do yeah. it that way and then it just it, yeah it just kind of got to a point where i was experimenting i don't know like i'm still figuring it out you know i, I the tier thing is hard but i have a friend who's oh, like yeah. you know you donate a dollar a month or you donate five dollars a month it's because you like my shit i'm already giving you stuff you know yeah, yeah that's fine <laughs> yeah like yeah, yeah. i don't have to like give you something for that tier in a way which i'm seeing a lot of different ways work out with that but yeah what is your patreon are you going to promote it uh i Can will we... i'm working on a little promo video at the moment and things like that 
Can I include um, it in this episode? Yeah, yeah of course. I'll, I'll send you all the links for all the stuff. But everything I do is just under the Alchemical Arts. Cool. Except I think Instagram, which is still under my old handle. Jeremy Francis Art? Art, uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then the Alchemical Arts, that's uh, patreon.com slash the Alchemical Arts. Yeah, and YouTube is the main space that I'll be releasing stuff on. And there's a Facebook page as well. But Awesome. Yeah, I'll have that all linked below. Yeah. And send me yeah. anything if I forget. You know. <laughs> okay. Or yeah. anything, not that if I forget, if if you forgot to, to mention in the interview. And if you process the audio from this and after you've released it, um, I'm happy to put the audio up on the channel too and send yeah. people your way. I mean, yeah, I'll that. give you all the raw if you want too. I have no problem uh, with that. <laughs> I'm happy with whatever you edit. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, yeah. thanks so much, Jeremy. It was good to meet you, man. Yeah, likewise. Um yeah, have you got more music coming out? Or? Uh, yes, uh, working on more of a live situation right now. So, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's been a year music. since I put out Cactus Crown, and I kind of, yeah, I'm trying to get more into playing out again, and, and we're working on something that's more multimedia video and stuff. So, yeah. yes, it's coming. It's just uh, playing it close to the chest, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I... Give the album a good like 30 or 40 listens. Oh, awesome. I love it. Oh, that's awesome, man. That feels great. Yeah, I will send you a bunch more too. And just give you everything I got. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, we should definitely talk again. Like, yeah. And... Yeah, just keep in touch for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I'd like to, um, with this, I hope to put, I do like little articles, you know, with each. Yep. Pragmagic episode, but I think in this case I'd like to showcase the um, YouTube page too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I was going to say, if any, any in the future when I get a little bit more established, if any of the artists within your collective want like materials that are alchemically prepared, yeah. I, I can I can work towards doing stuff like that. And if you want to post anything through We the Hollowed, like I will well, set you up yeah, to like, do that. Yeah. yeah. I'll get you a yeah, login we'll and everything. More about that in the future. Totally. But yeah, I'll figure that out this week. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, man. We'll right. have a good, like, full day, right? Yeah, I'm about to just get down to some work, I think. Cool. I've got. What am I working on here? This is some, like, um, like a plant root that I've been digesting and fermenting for a few days to try and make, like, a crimson pigment. Cool. So. Very cool. Play around with that. Awesome. Man. Well, have a good rest of your day. I'm gonna wind down. Yeah, have a good evening. Oh yeah, nice. Have a good one.